if you have ever gotten pregnant or struggled to get pregnant, you know how amazing human reproduction is. But we know so much about how it works. And that's why doctors can often help women get pregnant, even after years of trying. These advances were possible only because several billion dollars have been invested in studying human reproduction. The same is true for many domestic animals. But what about the Schwarzkies horse, or the scimitar horned oryx, or the black rhino? A major role of zoos and breeding centers is to maintain insurance populations of rare and endangered species, species that are threatened with extinction in the wild. Although the number of animals is important, specific focus is placed on maintaining genetic diversity and reducing inbreeding. It is quality over quantity. So rather than randomly pairing animals, animal managers use various computer programs to pick the best pairs. These pairings are not based on whether the animals like each other or are ravishingly good looking, but is based on genetic compatibility. When a desired pairing of a male and female fails to produce an offspring, we need to be prepared to intervene. As it turns out, we know surprisingly little about how, when, and under what conditions wild animals successfully reproduce. Neither do we fully understand the fundamental reproductive biology of these species to assist with their reproduction. That is why so many zoos struggle to breed animals in their care. And that matters more than ever. Zoos are the last hope for many endangered species who only have a few hundred or a few dozen individuals left alive. Like a modern day Noah's Ark, animal managers and researchers are working hard to make sure these species and their offspring thrive. If you haven't guessed, that's my job, figuring out how to help endangered species make babies. Obsessed with wildlife from a young age, I was hooked on National Geographic magazines and Sir David Attenborough's TV shows. I studied veterinary medicine in India. I volunteered at a tra traveling circus to gain experience with wild animals. While studying veterinary medicine, I fell in love with the field of reproduction. I joined the Smithsonian National Zoo where I pursued my doctoral training under the mentorship of pioneers in wildlife reproduction, doctors Jogail Howard and David Wilt. I studied the impacts of inbreeding on male fertility in cheetahs, clouded leopards, and tigers. I also participated in various other research projects, including on black-footed ferrets and giant pandas. Currently, I conduct research on rare and endangered ungulates, hoofed animals at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. We generate new knowledge on the reproductive biology of various species that we manage at our research center and in collaboration with zoos around the country. We analyze the reproductive hormones in males and females to understand their reproductive patterns. For males, we develop methods to safely collect and freeze semen for later use. For females, we test various hormones to control ovarian function and facilitate artificial inseminations. We also determine the best approaches to artificially inseminate females to achieve pregnancies. Once we have all this information, it is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle to assemble the pieces to successfully create babies via assisted reproductive technologies. During the past three decades, I've worked with all kinds of species like lions, elephants, zebras, and tapirs, just to name a few. One of the questions I always get asked, how we decide which species to work with. Typically, we focus our efforts on species that are threatened or endangered with extinction. We also work with species that are difficult to breed in human care. Finally, species that have very few animals in managed populations also demand our attention. For example, the Schwalski's horse went extinct in the wild in the late 1960s. A small number of animals were managed in zoos in the US and Europe, 
The Schwarzkis horse is a harem breeder where a single male mates with several females. Zoos collaboratively bred these animals naturally and managed to increase the number of animals in human care. Finally, in 1992, the Schwarzkis horse was reintroduced in Mongolia. This is a great example of how zoos have helped save a species from extinction. Currently, there are over 2,000 Schwarzkis horse in the world. It is important to note that all breedings are still guided by the genetic relatedness of these animals. The goal always is to maintain genetic diversity and minimize inbreeding. But on occasions, we find animals that are either behaviorally incompatible or difficult to transport between institutions for breeding. In this case, it is important to be able to produce the desired offspring using artificial reproductive technologies. Our first line of approach is to develop and apply artificial insemination. Although this technology is well established in the domestic horse, we knew little about the reproductive biology of the Schwalski's horse. One could argue a horse is a horse, but there were a number of questions that we had to find answers for. Are there reproductive cycles similar to the domestic mare? Can the hormones used in the domestic mare also be used to control the reproductive cycles in the Schwalski source? Can we safely and consistently collect semen from stallions? When is the ideal time to artificially inseminate the mares? We assembled a team of experts and validated protocols to safely anesthetize stallions and mares developed methods to collect and cryopreserve semen for later use. We trained females using positive reinforcement to provide us urine samples for hormone analysis. This allowed us to characterize the reproductive cycles of the Schwalski source. Interestingly, Schwalski source estrus cycles were three to four days longer in duration than the domestic mares. We then designed and build specialized animal handling facilities to safely conduct ultrasound exams and attempt artificial inseminations. Assessments of follicular growth reveal that most developing follicles ovulate when they reach about 40 millimeters in diameter. This was also different from what is known in the domestic horse. After over five years of collaborative research, we were successful in achieving the first ever pregnancies via artificial insemination in the species. This demonstrates the importance of understanding the fundamental reproductive biology of a species to develop assisted reproductive technologies. We are now confident that Schwalski's horse can be produced via artificial insemination, and this technology can be used to improve their genetic management. Another species that we are focused on is the scimitar horned oryx. It is listed as extinct in the wild by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. They went extinct in early 1980s due to illegal hunting. Fortunately, in the mid-1960s, about 50 animals were captured and sent to zoos in the US and Europe. Through careful genetic and reproductive management, Currently, there are over 1,500 animals in zoos globally. Further, there are several thousands of scimitar and oryx in private collections in the Middle East and in ranches in Texas. Recently, under the leadership of the United Arab Emirates and in partnership with the Sahara Conservation Fund, oryx were successfully reintroduced in Chad in North Africa. Currently, there are over 300 animals roaming freely and they reproduce on their own. To date, all animals who were made available for reintroduction were transported via air cargo to the Middle East or Chad, briefly acclimatized to the new environment and then released. Transporting live animals is expensive and risky. However, reproductive technologies such as semen cryopreservation and artificial insemination can eliminate the risk of injury or death during transport and reduce cost of re reintroduction programs. We have developed methods to collect and bank semen from the oryx. In fact, the Smithsonian Institution currently maintains the largest collection of frozen semen samples for the species. Recently, we focused our efforts on developing a non-invasive artificial insemination technology for the oryx. 
We build specialized handling facilities that permit safe handling of animals without the use of anesthetic drugs. We then tested and validated the use of hormones to optimize the time of insemination to achieve pregnancies. The most exciting development was that we were able to produce live offspring using semen samples that were collected and frozen more than 15 years ago. In this case, the semen donor is no longer alive, but was still able to contribute to the genetics of the extant population. We believe this technology can be safely applied in animals being managed in the Middle East and being prepared for reintroduction in Chad. The greatest benefit would be that we can transport frozen sperm from scores of genetically valuable males from zoos around the world, artificially inseminate the females, and release the pregnant females. This approach would, would eliminate the need to transport males to reintroduction sites and significantly reduce the risk of injury to animals. In our line of work, we face other challenges too. Although most of our efforts are focused on genetic management, sometimes we have to assist with improving reproductive fitness or overall health. For example, a sick animal is much less likely to successfully produce offspring than a healthy one. Although a small number of black rhinos are managed in zoos, more effort is needed to save the species. Why is this work important? Several thousand rhinos are killed by poachers annually. While anti-poaching efforts are yielding promising results, black rhinos could benefit from being managed in human care. As we prepare to rescue more animals from the wild, we need to understand how to maintain the health of these animals so that they can continue to grow and lead to future reintroductions. But black rhinos experience a myriad of chronic health conditions, some of which also affect reproductive fitness. This leads us to the question, how do we improve black rhino health? Diet and nutrition are key to health. Interestingly, all rhinos are not created equal. Different rhino species have different nutritional needs. For example, the white rhinos are grazers and they obtain most of their dietary needs from feeding on grasses. So when animals are imported from the wild and brought into managed care, white rhinos are able to maintain normal health by consuming grasses and other supplements provided to them. In contrast, black rhinos are browsers, selectively picking and choosing leaves, branches, and twigs. We know that wild black rhinos consume over 200 species of browse material. It is believed that several of these plants supply various nutrients and protective byproducts that help maintain good health. But black rhinos in zoos and breeding centers outside of the range countries are often fed browse from no more than 20 to 25 species of plants. Diversity and quality of browse is also impacted by their geographic location and seasons. Nutritionists and animal managers constantly strive to improve the diets of black rhinos and zoos, but often struggle to meet these requirements. A major contributing factor is the lack of knowledge regarding what the 200 plus plant species consumed in the wild provide these animals. It is not clear how these plants and plant products influence rhino health. Recent studies in human and animal models have shown that diet influences gut microbial diversity and function, which in turn can affect the overall health of the host animal. We recently demonstrated differences in gut microbial composition between wild and zoo managed rhinos. Several black rhinos managed in zoos also are affected by a metabolic syndrome called the iron overload syndrome, wherein Animals absorb excessive amounts of iron from the diet. The excess iron slowly accumulates in various internal organs, leading to disease onset and eventually death. Currently with funding from the Morris Animal Foundation, we are collaborating with researchers from the South African National Parks, George Mason University, George Washington University, and Princeton University to solve the mystery surrounding black rhino health. Our research efforts are focused on multiple fronts. 
we are applying advanced DNA barcoding technologies to identify the plant wild rhinos eat. We are also analyzing microbial composition of fecal samples as a proxy for gut microbial health. We have collected blood products from over 50 wild black rhinos, and we plan to analyze using proteomic approaches to identify biomarkers of health and disease in black rhinos. We are also studying rhino immune function by analyzing cell signaling pathways in white blood cells. Overall, we plan to compare results between wild and zoo-managed rhinos to identify the underlying causes of chronic disease in black rhinos managed in zoos. Our goal is to use this information to improve rhino nutrition, develop pre- or probiotic supplements, evaluate alternate browse preservation strategies to ensure that high-quality browse is available throughout the year in all geographic areas. Overall, through our research, we hope that we will learn to take better care of our remaining black rhinos. It's a first step in conserving the species and helping them reproduce in the future. In the meantime, there are several things that you can do to help save our endangered species. Support your favorite nonprofit organization or local zoos so that they can expand their efforts in saving endangered species in range countries. If you are affiliated with a university or a research organization, explore opportunities to collaborate with zoo-based researchers to increase our understanding of the biology of the various species. Support ongoing efforts to recruit and retain aspiring biologists and conservationists so that no time is lost in saving these charismatic species. Everyone has a role to play. I invite you to join us in these efforts to save our planet's biodiversity. Thank you for joining us today. And next time, I hope to be back with some exciting news about cute baby rhinos and more.